Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna rip through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media. I'll interject my financial opinions as we go. Generally related to three different topics, wealth building, commodities, and or financial topics. Sometimes I do talk about things that are similar to those, those things as well and make comments. Uh, so let's dive in there, let's take a look and see what people are sharing. Uh, if you wanna follow me on here, at Finance Score Finance, and if you want to join our community, finding-value.com, where I dive deeper into all of these topics, share my opinions very freely about companies, sectors, when I'm buying, what I'm buying, all of those things. So let's get down to freight economist. The long-anticipated freight capacity correction might finally be underway. Trucking carriers did not add as many drivers as they usually do in this time of year. The data shows an increase of 9.4 thousand in May compared to 15.4 thousand in May of 23 and 24.3 thousand in May of 2022. So this is trucking employment, thousands of employees. We can kind of see we've been tracking sideways for a while. And here's my question. We did that huge stimulus in 2020. And then I've talked about you know, with people on the website, this stimulus overhang. Is that part of the stimulus overhang where we've kind of been just tracking sideways? Um, is it a slowdown? Is it a recession? Is it driven by lack of stimulus and that money kind of working its way through the system? Or is it driven by real slowdowns in the system where we've got unemployment and all these other things going way up? I don't, I mean, the the natural cycle, I don't think it's occurring from the natural cycle. I think it's from the stimulus overhang. It doesn't mean that we can't get a slowdown, but I don't think it's going to be a great financial crisis type move. Uh, if we do get a slowdown, uh, that does come. I, I call it the stimulus overhang. Like, like you're, you're hung over after drinking the night before. It's kind of the same thing. You've got this overhang or this stimulus hangover from, you know, the stimulus that we got in 2020. And right now, we still have a bunch of fiscal spending going on as well. It's We're getting all this stimulus through all these different means across the board. Uh, but it doesn't mean that this, the fiscal spending will directly impact trucking employment. Um, these things can impact the markets differently and can impact different sectors differently. Depends where the money comes into the system and how it flows through the system. Energy headline news, financial demand for oil is likely to rise if currently very low speculative positioning normalizes. Yeah, I know that. That's why I'm positioning in oil because no one's in it. Um, when you look at these areas, a lot of these areas were pretty good times to buy oil um, when the positioning is really low. <clears throat> so this is financial demand for oil is likely to rise if currently very low speculative positioning normalizes. Um, we'll see. Maybe people are worried about a recession. Maybe there's a whole bunch of different things that are in there. But generally speaking, when people are not there, that is a good time to be there. You know, it's, it's great to go shopping at the grocery store when people aren't there. And it's really crappy when there's a whole bunch of people in line and you just want to check out. <laughs> so um, I've really adopted kind of my entire life around the ease of doing things. Uh, and that's kind of almost like shopping for, for stocks and companies. You want to buy it when no one's there. You want to buy it when the speculative positioning is low. You buy it when no one's looking at that at the stock or the sector, and it's just so easy to get in. I mean, well, it's a little harder to buy it if the volume's low, but for the most part, you can get really cheap shares. Real easy to go through the grocery store with no lines. So we got Logan here. He says, a good example of difference in the cycles, the real estate cycles, in 2024, existing home sales days on the market is 26 days. In 2011, days on the market was 105 days. New listing data this week, 72,000 homes this week. 
New listing data this week in 2011 was 400,000 homes. Big difference. Completely different market conditions for the real estate market. You got housing here, and I do like talking about housing because that is a big part of the cycle. Housing June 10th weekly update. Inventory up 1.1% week over week. We are up about 38% year over year, and that's the years here. But we are still far below 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, <clears throat> and even 2020, where we draw down into really poor uh, inventory levels. And, and where we're at today, yes, we're going up, but it's from very low levels. And we're still below levels that home prices go up under. So are we in a slowdown? The housing market is slowing down, but we're not in a slowdown. Um, like as in prices are just going to fall off a cliff. They're still going to go up if we maintain levels anywhere near where we're at today. Uh, they're still going to go up even if we were to double our active inventory. Home prices will still go up if we double it. What is going on with Ivanhoe Electric today? Stock is up 20% on no news. You know, I see this a lot, and a lot of people ask me this question. Why did this stock go up? Why did this thing do that? Um, when, you, when you've been in the market and you kind of go through these big cycles, I just stop asking that question. Like it, it just doesn't matter to me anymore. Um, everyone gets so obsessed over things that in my opinion just don't matter. Uh, if I am in a stock and I'm, and yes, I'll probably just because I'm curious, I probably look to see if there was any news. But does that really matter? It doesn't if you're taking a long term kind of look at things. If I'm buying this in 2020. I'm going to hold it to 2028 or 2030 or something like that. Does it matter if some news came out and the stock goes up or down by 10 or 20%? Not really. The question I always ask myself is, well, did the market conditions change? Did What's the commodity doing? And has anything changed over the time frame that can negatively impact the long-term uh, trajectory of the stock and of the business or stock? If the answer is no, it's like, I don't even like seeing the big updates anymore. Um, I know that sounds weird because everybody wants these things to go up like massively in a day. I prefer a stock that just goes up two, three, four percent and it just chugs, chug, chug, chug and small down days. And we get into, you know, like the stair step pattern where we just keep stair stepping up small amounts, small amounts. I'm not a big fan of the huge volatility where it goes up 20% and then the next day it's down like 10%. I like the ones that just chug, chug, chug. Uh, they continue to chug higher. They get like 3 4% up days. And every once in a while you get like some half percent down days or something like that. Those are the ones I like. And they just keep going up. So wanted to say that. Um, Tony says, where's all my uranium can't go down people at? My question is, why is he saying this? Like, what's the point of this post? I get a little agitated, a little bit annoyed at people that act like kindergartners. Like, I just get a little bit annoyed. It's like, uranium can't go, where's all my uranium can't go down people? Like, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to piss the uranium people off? Are you trying to make a point to those that, uh, that were telling them that uranium can't go down? I don't know. Uh, but I, I just don't like this crap. It, it's like, I feel like I'm back in kindergarten again looking at this. I wanted to talk about it because it's like, what are you doing? If you're in a bull market, you want to keep people kind of like bullish on the overall long-term outlook. Don't be trying to belittle people. Oh, yeah, I got the short-term market call right. Who cares? It doesn't matter. We're in this for the bull market. Uranium's going to do some crazy stuff. Is it going to do it? all the time? No. And during the last bull market, some stocks had a crazy amount of volatility. I mean, crazy guys. 
I think some of them had like seven or eight 50% pullbacks in the bull market. So one, you, you're going to see a lot of pullbacks. Two, they can be very big. And three, you're still in a bull market, even if you get 40, 50% pullbacks. Some companies had like 70% pullbacks and that, that, that's pretty rough. I mean, that is, yeah, that, 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 that's pretty rough. So here's, here's bad Billy Pratt, whoever that is. He says, you can't tell me when a millennial's given up on life by looking at when they stop posting on Instagram. I just want to make a comment here because I was reading this and says, millennials, when did you stop, just stop posting on social media? I don't even have Instagram. I'm a millennial. I'm the oldest millennial. And I don't have Instagram. I don't have Facebook. Um, like personally, I don't have Facebook. I had signed up a long time ago and then deleted it because it just caused too many problems. And I don't know, maybe I just have different genetics than the majority of people and I view the world differently, but these things all give me a headache. Um, if I didn't have this YouTube channel, I probably wouldn't be on Twitter at all. The only reason I'm on Twitter is because I do updates on YouTube. And you guys, you know, I like looking at the updates. I like the information. Uh, but for the most part, I wouldn't be on it if I, if I didn't, if I weren't doing this. So my suggestion is, you know, be careful on being on these things. Not about posting. Like, these things give me a headache. And I can't imagine those who are on it all the time. Like, you guys are probably, like, in your brain have something miswired. That's the way I look at it. Like this stuff is not good for your mental health. Investment wisdom from Warren Buffett. He says, a great investment opportunity occurs when a marvelous business encounters a one-time huge but solvable problem. I'm going to give you an example. Chipotle some years ago uh, had an E. coli scare. It enters a one-time huge but solvable problem. It was a great time to enter that stock when it finally stopped going down. I think it went down to $300 or upper $200, if I can remember. Perfect time to buy the crap out. Now it's at, I don't know what it's at anymore, $1,800, something like that. Something way higher. Um, but that's a great opportunity if something like that does occur. Kobiasi letter, the U.S. government is spending as if we were in a crisis. U.S. government expenditures as percent of GDP just hit 43%, matching levels seen during the 2008 financial crisis. To put this into perspective, spending as a percent of GDP is just 1% below World War II levels. Even at the peak of World War I, U.S. government spending as a percent of GDP was 20% uh, percentage points lower. Meanwhile, the Fed continues to call for a soft landing, and economic data is strong. This is a crisis. And there's 44%. Look at all the spending we've got over here, guys. What is going on? What is going on here? Yeah, give me some gold. Give me some gold. So U.S. retail sales, uh, they're down 0.31% year over year. It says retail sales flatline before a recession. There's the flat line of recession, flat line of recession, and then maybe we have a recession coming. Or is it that stimulus overhang that I talk about where the stimulus jacked us up, it pulled forward the demand, and then behind it, you're going to get a slowdown. Is that what occurred? Is that the stimulus hangover slash overhang that, we're, that, I, that I talk about? This here is driven by a slowdown. This here... Did the stimulus just yank it all forward, which caused an, a, a hangover afterwards? I, tough to say. Here's Logan. It says, the HELOC story is so overblown. So credit limit and balance of, for credit cards and HE revolving. So HELOC balance, I mean, it's pretty low down here compared to previous years. Uh, so he's saying it's all overblown. Uh, the world is full of foolish gamblers, and they will not do well. They will not do as well as the patient investor, says Charlie Munger. And I have adopted the patient investor uh, completely. 
Uh, it, it, it definitely works. Patience is required, and that's where you get the big time money. Game of Trade says this is one of the most unaffordable markets in U.S. history. Current levels were only seen in 1989, 1990, and 2006. Both of these periods ended up in a recession. Well, what if we had the largest? Uh, what if we had the largest mismatch between demand and supply? What would that look like, and what would affordability be? If you had the largest mismatch, you'd have the most unaffordable levels. That's exactly what we've got. <clears throat> so these two levels, we had a bunch of inventory. Inventory was climbing like no other. This level down here, we don't have the same inventory uh, levels climbing like we did back then. So these two areas, in my opinion, are not the same as what we have today. U.S. oil output to fall next year unless rig counts rise, key energy investor says at Bloomberg. A drop of 1 million barrels per day is possible as fields decline. Van, Nels Von Nelson executive says $90 oil needed to boost rig counts. So the, <clears throat> we need higher oil and we need rig counts to start to move up. Well, I know a way to invest in that. <laughs> and we're doing it on the website there. Uh, as the Fed becomes significantly more active in supporting financial markets, the buy-the-dip trend has strengthened accordingly. Why not? If the Fed is going to bail you out, what's the risk? And this is what he's talking about here. This is the average S&P one-day return after down days. This is the 10-year moving average. And you can see that we had a bunch of, uh, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, but somehow in the 90s, we just have been working our way on up. And now we've got buy the dip. What's going on here? That looks a little suspicious. Is there some market rigging going on here? It looks like it. <laughs> Here's Ryan. If the creditors' markets aren't worried, it is hard to see a major economic slowdown headed our way. So basically, the credit markets, the bond market, if they don't see anything and sort of any sort of problem, like see how this is spiking? That occurred before 2008. The spike occurred before 2020. And even back here, we can see a spike um, that occurred. We just don't, we didn't have that spike here, which makes me think that there's no recession coming. The credit markets are not worried. <clears throat> The commodities currency AUD has a magnificent setup, which is the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. It's reversing up from around here, I think, and it has some catching up to do versus the CRB. Yet another sign inflation is not backing down. And these this usually goes up with commodities. You can see in 2002, big move higher here all the way to 2008, the crash, and then we came all the way back up and peaked. 2012, 2013. He's got an inverted head and shoulders that an impossible move higher here uh, soon for the Australian dollar to outperform, signaling, in my opinion, uh, commodities probably strengthening with it. Uh, these major housing markets are back above pre pandemic inventory levels uh, all through here. So here's, I just wanted to click on this. Um, can't really zoom in too much, but these are the ones that have increased inventory levels and everything below it is a, is a decline. So very few areas have an increase in levels. Uh, the top one there was Austin, Texas, with the highest increase of inventory levels. So Bob Elliott, and I want to I want to go through this, guys. I want to talk uh, I read a couple of his things here. He says recess recessions just, you know, they don't just happen out of nowhere. They are consequences of a series of causes that create self-reinforcing slowdown dynamic. Those early stage dynamics have yet to occur in the United States. Until they shift, moderating growth can happen. But a recession is unlikely to come. He says the main thing that shifts an economy into recession is when there's an impetus for either HH or business to slow spending growth. That typically happens in one of three ways. We see a decline in asset prices drives higher savings. 
a rise in rates causing slowing of borrowing or an exogen exogenous stop. The first is definitely not present today as the prices are at all-time highs for stocks. Houses are also at all-time highs. And put together the rate of household net worth, it's still rising at a pace that is more typical of expansions than contractions. It's going up. Further, credit growth is already very slow. And so there is not much risk of an acute slowing from here. That's very different from previous expansion phases where credit growth was elevated. Just compare today's points to say 2019, 2006, and 1999, which are very totally different. And the yellow line is where we're at today, which is at a very low level compared to history. And that's your credit growth. With households borrowing particularly soft relative to previous expansions, the only time it's been lower in the last 75 years was just after the great financial crisis. It's hard to see a setup for it going meaningfully softer in the short term without some other force in place. So he's arguing or not a recession. So some will suggest that higher rates have long and variable lags and the impact of higher rates have not fully flowed through the economy. The reality is that rates have been in the ballpark of where they are today since the fall of 2022, almost two years now. In addition, we aren't seeing the type of slowdowns in the most cyclically sensitive sectors that are through time have been the most impactful in creating the self-reinforcing downward dynamic of most recessions. These are usually the important indicators of a shift. And he's got all employees construction, which is a great indicator. That's what I use. And all employees manufacturing, and they're not contracting here. They are high. And that's what I look at in some of my indicators. He says, as I've said many times, there's an ordering to get, it, to, get to a recession. The thing that matters is the order, not the time frame. We are still on step one. And here's the steps of the order. The order of the macro linkages matters more than the calendar time to create growth turn and durable inflation's decline. So here they are. Rates rise, stocks fall, demand slows, earnings decline, job market weakens, wage growth slows, inflation durably falls to target. And we are, we are at rates rise and that's all we're at. And that's where I, when I said this, um, I keep looking for stocks to fall. That's the second shoe to drop. And I haven't seen it yet because this is all forward looking. So we get a, a raise in right, you get a raise in rates, the yield curve inverts, then you should see your S&P fall or your tech stocks fall. And we just haven't seen it yet. And that's where I'm in the camp. Like, I don't think a recession is coming, at least not yet. It says, until rates rise enough to create a decline in asset prices, it is unlikely that the economy will shift to a self-reinforcing recession. And with roughly two months of data in the quarter, things continue to look far from a recession in outcome. Growth will likely be softer ahead, which is normal as we get to a later cycle. And it is likely to be softer than very elevated expectations priced into stocks. But just because growth is softer than these extremely elevated expectations doesn't mean a recession is present. It's only when we see yields higher and stocks falling, which will slow spending and raise saving rates. Until that happens, we are likely to remain in an expansion that looks more like the 50s, 60s than most of the cycles as of late. As, the, as those show, expansions can go on for a while. And this is the unemployment rate, and you can see the unemployment rate going up, and you can see a big, huge unemployment rate continuing to decline in the 60s. And that's what he has for that one. Just kind of wanted to go over that. Um, if you want to know when silver is in full-on, confirmed, powerful bull market mode, this chart will tell you, and this is the S&P 500 versus silver. And when it goes down, silver's outperforming, and we've got a break to the downside where silver could outperform 
the S&P 500. And we've got that breakdown already, guys. It's looking good for silver. Not looking good for the S&P 500. Logan says, recession doesn't equal a housing crisis. Home prices change of the last six recessions. 6.1% last recession, three and a half. Here's a recession, minus 1.9. Recession, 6.6. .6. Recession, that's a bad one. That's a housing market crash. And a recession, 6%. So house prices, just because we get a recession doesn't mean house prices go down. That's a misconception. People don't know history. Duh. <laughs> and that's what I've got there. So um, that's all I've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the website if you'd like. Uh, we do have a question and answer session coming up on Sunday, 5 p.m. And then I'll go in and answer your guys' questions. Maybe we'll talk more about um, the previous session. We talked a little bit about the strategies and why I'm deploying it, some of the outcomes of last commodity bull market, why I'm positioning the way that I am. Um, maybe we can continue to talk about uh, entry points and why that is so critical. Maybe that's something we should do uh, coming up on Sunday. Uh, so uh, that's what we've got for uh, today. Uh, we'll catch you later. This is Finding Value.